Greetings all. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm Jonathan Crook, your pilgrim of a storyteller, here with the story of The First Thanksgiving. Scrooby England, the early 1600s. A pounding shakes, a house, and folks inside felt besieged. They cried, I thought we were praying separately. What are they doing pounding outside of our doors? And voices began howling and harassing, crying. What are you doing in there? How dare you pray outside of the church? Who do you think you are? You're heretics, that's what you are. We should burn you. They did manage, however, to frighten off these interlopers interfering with their prayers. But then the likes of, well, Elder Brewster and others said, we need now to become pilgrims. Thus they set out from England to go to a place where people were embraced, or at least tolerated, for having a different faith other than that of, well, the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church. They arrived, pilgrims, in Holland. They went to the city of Leiden, where they understood all manner of people were accepted, even Anabaptists and Jews. And there, these separatists, who preferred to pray without pomp, under their own circumstances, took up a new life, taking on jobs that, well, others didn't really want to do in the city of Leiden. Some became carpenters, some became street cleaners, but they all worked hard. And these pilgrims began to raise their children. It was said that some of the women folk grew agitated when after a time, their children came home and were chattering away in Dutch. Well, that caused Elder Brewster and William Bradford and others to contemplate. Brewster came forward and held up a letter. This is from a merchant company in London. They're seeking settlers in the New World, in the northern parts of Virginia. They fear that, well, folk from the Netherlands will get there first, settle and claim the lands that, um, well, an Englishman Henry Hudson had claimed some time ago, along with John Smith and others. We're wondering, who would like to come on this expedition? Truly, we would be pilgrims, building a new life, separate from all, blessed by God, with a new world. Well, many were curious, but only about fifty wanted to go. And they gathered together in two ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower, and shed copious tears, looking on the shores of Europe, realizing they would never see many of their family members again. And into the ocean sailed the ships, the Mayflower reeking of old wine that had once hauled up from Spain, but the Speedwell, why, it wasn't reeking, rather it was leaking. And to Plymouth they had to go. And there, the company determined they needed more people to settle, and so they imposed upon the pilgrims more pilgrims who decided that, well, now there were people on board who were strange to them, the likes of Miles Standish, those who were not practicing their separate way of praying without pomp or circumstance. Crowding aboard the Mayflower, saints and strangers, 
embarked upon a voyage of sixty days across the ocean. Early on during those days, when the pilgrims gathered on the deck and round the stew pot put in their peas to make their porridge with a bit of, well, salted pork, pulling out the hard tack, already beginning to crawl with worms. They turned up their noses, and some, some of those pilgrim saints and strangers alike, <coughs> retched their guts out over the side boards of the Mayflower. Ha, ha, ha! Look at you landlubbers, cried out one of the sailors. Ah, you'll perish on this boat. We'll be throwing your bodies over along with what you're puking out of your guts. Ha, ha, ha! He laughed and mocked them. But the pilgrims mostly stayed below, it being a stormy voyage. Why, at one point, crossing the ocean, the great main mast cracked, and Captain Christopher Jones went to Elder Brewster and the other leaders, like John Bradford, saying sternly, We must use that large metal screw to hold together this vessel. But we intend to use that screw to hold together our church, our meeting house, when we kept to the new world. You'll be meeting with the bottom of the ocean in your deaths. We all will if we don't use that screw to hold together the Mayflower. And thus the screw held together the vessel. Twas said during the maintenance of that mast, that rude sailor, who called out to the pilgrims, saying that they would soon follow the puke from their guts to the bottom of the sea. Well, see what Providence did. It cast him into the water, and he gave up the ghost. The voyage proved mostly uneventful, with the saints and strangers staying down below, but on occasion they'd come up upon the decks, and during one of those occasions the Billingsley lads, why, one of them took their father's pistol and shot it off in some prank. Well, it proved to be quite the jape. A bit of spark from the firing gun caught hold of the gunpowder, and if it hadn't been for quick thinking by the ship's crew, why, the Mayflower would have blown up in the hands of those Billington's boys. And after sailing for weeks, November the ninth, Land ho! Land ho! they cried. It wasn't the land they intended to fall upon. That land was along what was called Northern Virginia, a river wide-mouthed, explored by the likes of Verrazano and Smith and Cabot and Hudson. Nay, they weren't there, though. They were ne near a, an arm of land that the sailors called Cape Cod for the fish they often found about the banks there. Well, folk aboard the Mayflower after sixty days at sea, their clothes reeking, their bellies filled only with peas and hardtack and porridge, why, they came to shore rejoicing. They cleaned their clothes in the streams, broke off branches of juniper, and brought them back to the Mayflower, and almost at once. Why, debates raged. We're in a new world. Why do we need King James to be our sovereign? Every man here, every woman, could be their own king and queen in this new world. Ah, we can all start afresh. Truly, we'll be separatists here. But some of the women listened, and they said, Don't you realize? We need all to work together. And thus they forced the likes of Bradford and Winslow and Tilly and Standish to craft a document 
an agreement. Different than anything, why put forth by a king? This said they be subjects, but it mostly said that they would live and work and help each other together. Just listen. In the name of God, amen. We, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subject of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, and etc., having undertaken for the glory of God in the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combined ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinance, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most inconvenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we, hitherunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod on the 11th of November in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, on, and the 18th of Scotland, the 45th Anno Domino, 1620. And the women folk insisted the men sign their names to that document. And a, they add a toast of beer to it. They needed a place to settle. Again, arguments broke out. It's November. We need to go to the river explored by Henry Hudson, northern Virginia. Oh, there's little time, said Captain Christopher Jones, to sail that distance. You'd best build your community somewhere near Cape Cod. And thus... The first of three discoveries got organized. Miles Standish, the stout fellow nicknamed Captain Shrimp, would lead these expeditions, though one of them was led by Captain Christopher Jones of the Mayflower. They had a little shallop, a small boat about 16 feet long, but it had been uh, damaged by people sleeping in it during the journey across the ocean. They brought it to shore and began to make repairs. And in that time, Standish and some of the other men began to wander about on Cape Cod. They saw six men on the beach and thought maybe they were men from the Mayflower or fishermen, but soon realized they were native men of the Nauset tribe with a dog. They soon ran off into the wood hoping to make contact with his blunderbuss in hand. Standish said, Come, let's pursue, let's pursue. They did pursue, but found themselves lost in bramble and pine and sand. They organized another discovery. This time, they came upon a hill and clambered on it and discovered mounds which they unearthed, and within the mounds they found thirty-six ears of a peculiar kind of corn. It was red and yellow, orange, and even blue. Realizing they would need something on which to subsist, and wanting seed, they took the corn. Miles Standish glowered whilst their new governor, William Bradford said, We will return the favor of this corn. They returned, and Standish sat and listened as Bradford said, 
we must attend to present necessities. Here, there are no inns or taverns or churches to greet us. Standish said, we must organize yet another discovery. And this they set out with a repaired shallop and sailed around and hoped to find a river, uh, perhaps where they'd have a safe harbor. But they found, well, less than safety and more cold. During the time, it began to sleet, and they said, our clothing froze to us like iron, and the rudder on the little shallop broke, and if it hadn't been for the uh, commanding sailing skills and rowing skills of the, the master gunner, a fellow by the name of Coppin, they never would have made it to shore. And then they let another fellow by the name of Clark row them in after the mast on that little shallop broke, the Mayflower being docked on the other side, the discovery party had to fend for themselves that night. They had seen during the day a party of Nauset Indians cleaning a large black fish, but when they accosted, the native folk ran off into the wood. Perhaps they knew something about these strange, pasty-colored people with peculiar colors in their hair and eyes. They brought disease, a pox. Well, they set camp on Clark Island and then went back to shore. Cape Cod looked around a bit and poked again at a place they began to call Corn Hill. They found more mounds, but when these were unearthed, they discovered beads and trinkets in one of the baskets, more corn in another, but then they found bones, a skull, which they knew had to be from a sailor. The hair was still clinging to the skull, and it was yellow. In a little sack, they found the bones of a baby. And they left this place. It went about and encamped, hunting geese. At one point, walking along, they happened upon acorns scattered about on the ground, and, and Bradford, unaware that this was a snare, got his leg caught in it. How oh, they had quite the laugh. Well, that would preserve them, perhaps for the more dangerous time yet to come. For when they camped on the final discovery, along Cape Cod at night, they heard what seemed to be beasts howling in the night. Ho, 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 lunch! Ho, 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 lunch! Go ahead and try and make that sound. Ho, 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 lunch! And when dawn broke, Arrows began to fly in the air over their encampment. And Miles Standish was the only one who managed to keep his powder dry. He fired three times at a huge chieftain hiding behind a tree who let out a guttural scream and then, Ha! Ha! Ho! Orange! They ran off the Nossets into the wood. Back on board the Mayflower, there was much debate. We should settle on Clark's Island. It's safe. No, no, we need to find a, a goodly river. Well, we explored uh, the river co we call the Palmet, but it, it it's too thick. Well, why don't we go settle up at Corn Hill? Too high and deathly. We should sail south to Virginia. Too long, too long. Well, on the charts provided by uh, uh, Captain John Smith, they noted a place where he had inscribed right kind of at the shoulder of Cape Cod, the word Plymouth. There they went. They went ashore, and to a said Mary Chiltern was among the first, perhaps the first, to clamber down upon a stone. They decided, when they found a field where corn had been planted, where there had once perhaps been a native village, this would be a good place. 
Miles Standish saying, I can put my cannon up over here. We have water over there. And thus, Plymouth Colony began. On Christmas Day, the pilgrims worked hard. When some of the sailors took up a bit of beer and began to sing, why, they were shouted down and ordered, Put down the beer and get back to work! But Captain Christopher Jones insisted on something, sharing some of the ship's beer. And that was quite a blessing, because the pilgrims, why, the men were forced to have a ration of just a gallon of beer a day. They cut down trees. They began to build a storehouse, a meeting house, twenty by twenty, and little shacks that were to be their houses. But recall, when the clothes had froze to them on one of the discoveries and caused the pilgrim to think why they were wearing coats of iron, well, something of that cold got into them, and the cold became fever, pneumonia, and some of the pilgrims began to perish. Miles Standish advised, We best not bury the bodies. There's eyes upon us. Don't you remember what happened? And Bradford recalled a time when they had left tools in the field and returned to have their supper. And when they went back out into the fields, the tools were gone. The native folk had taken them, fascinated by the amount of metal in the tools. But when a couple of young men got lost in the wood, they too returned along with the tools by the native folk. But the winter proved harsh. Many stayed upon the Mayflower, remained all throughout that winter. But among the hundred and one or so passengers, even though a baby by the name of Oceanus and then Peregrin were born, forty-six died. Mostly the men about thirty-four, thirty-five, eight boys, two girls, eleven women. And then the pilgrims, sometimes reduced to, why, chasing scavenger birds away from seals or other creatures washed up near Plymouth Harbor in order to have something to eat, had a blessing. It came in mid-March in the form of a lanky fellow ambling in from the woods wearing nothing but a loincloth and a thick coat of grease, his hair pulled back, shaved along the sides, tattoos adorning his face. But he did something that, why, made the good folk at Plymouth, why, leap with a sensation of being blessed. He lifted up his hand, and in their tongue said, Welcome, Englishman, Samoset, friend. And they exclaimed and said, It's a godsend, he speaks our English. They sat him down by a fire, and though they had not much to eat themselves, they gave him a duck, which they expected he would share, but... The roasted duck, why, he devoured the entire thing. And they watched eagerly, the children kind of cowering behind their mothers and fathers. He explained he would go and return with someone who spoke even more English than Samoset. True to his word, when Samoset returned, he bought a, brought with him a fellow with gray streaks in his hair who gave a bow, a courtly one, and, in rather fine English, announced, I am Squanto. I welcome you. This place where now you settle, 
once was my village of the Pawtuxet. But some years ago, fishermen came and brought your pox upon us. I was unaware of this. I, you see, had been abducted. Twelve, thirteen years ago now, and sold into slavery in a place you call Spain. But there the Franciscan friars who took me uh, took pity upon me. They taught me many things, and they taught me how to get back to London. And after some time I managed to get on board a fishing vessel and returned to my people after seven, eight years. I found my people had mostly died of your pox. My people don't do well with it. I took up residence with a local chieftain, Massasoit of the Wampanoag, a powerful nation. They are the ones fascinated by your metal tools. They know well the Nossets, and Massasoit wishes to meet with you. He's curious about your guns. I'm sure you're curious to know how he may serve to, well, protect you from some of the other tribes who may not look upon you as favorable. I described that you have come in peace. Would you be interested in meeting Massasoit? Well, Bradford and the other pilgrims agreed, and they met with Massasoit and began to craft a treaty. Now, while the treaty was being crafted, beyond the marriage of Priscilla Mullins and John Alden, much to the chagrin of poor Captain Shrimp, Miles Standish, he was sweet upon Priscilla too, but then just about every young man aboard the Mayflower was. About twenty houses got built. A few acres of land got cleared. The pilgrims attempted to plant their English peas and beans, but they did not fare well. Squanto showed them a trick he had picked up from the monks. You dig a hole about the depth of your foot, and in the bottom put a fish head, cover it over, and plant the three sisters corn, bean, and squash, and they'll have plenty to grow on. Squanto proved right. Sister Corn, Bean, and Squash provided such a bounty for the saints and the strangers that come October, Bradford announced, We will have a harvest frolic, and we will invite our allies, Samoset, Squanto, Massasoit, and we will celebrate Though forty-six of us have perished, almost half our company, but we still will celebrate and thank God for our blessings. And indeed they celebrated. But when Chief Massasoit showed up with ninety ravenous warriors, ah, oh, some of the women folk, they cried, however are we going to provide for all of these, these men? What are we going to do? Sensing this, Massasoit, though kind of a stern, dour fellow, face-painted red arms always folded across his chest, pointed, held up five fingers, and off went some of his warriors. They soon returned with five deer. They butchered and roasted them on the spot, along with swan, geese, duck, eels, lobster, and, um, kind of an exotic bird. Uh, they gave the name to everything from pheasants to grouse. Um, the turkey. Yes, that was it. And they roasted them all up, along with a big mess of succotash, uh, the corn and the peas, uh, with various flavorings mixed in. And they made plum pudding as well. And they jumped to their feet. First the native folk. Hi-o-a-gene-ya! hi o a gene And they danced what 
Bradford described was an antic dance. Well, not to be outdone. The saints and strangers jumped to their feet. They did a little do side do and they spun partners round and about, and sang out and clapped their hands. I gets up in the morn when you sound the harvest horn. My master here is gone away. Hey! And on they danced. Miles Standish wanted to be sure of something. He wanted to know um, that the native folk feared the English firepower. Boom! Thus he ordered exercising of arms, and they fired off the muskets and the cannons, and that caused a lot of fear among the native folk. But they returned the favor themselves and shot out arrows. They played other games, too, that they taught one another, and the celebration of thanks lasted for three days. And at the end, a treaty was signed, the first among many such between those who crossed the salty waters with their strangely colored skin and eyes and hair and clothes, and those, the people of the earth. The treaty lasted over 50 years, one of the longest agreements between these two very different and often feuding people. But friends, at least in that time, 1621, when the first Thanksgiving was announced and celebrated, there people enjoyed a time of peace. Would be many more years before the holiday became official. But, official or not, why don't we all embrace the principle of the pilgrims and the native folk and join together any way we can to give thanks. And good friends, that in short, in part, is the tale of the first Thanksgiving. I'm thankful you listen. Be of good cheer.